and welcome to the Party Center Speaks podcast. This is the podcast for family entertainment center and event venue owners, operators, managers, and staffers looking to grow their business. Want to learn more about how you can increase party bookings, improve facility operations, and other topics? This is the podcast for you. My name is Laura Canellas, and I'm the marketing manager here at Party Center Software. In this episode, we're going to share audio from our webinar on creating a better experience for your target demographic. We hope you enjoy this presentation. We are here today to talk about creating a better experience for your target demographic. And we are featuring Creative Works. You'll see Danny and Russ over there. They're going to introduce themselves in a minute. We want to run through a couple of things. First, welcome. If this is your first time on a PCS webinar, we are so happy to have you here. If you're returning, we are so happy to have you here. Either way, we love doing these webinars for you guys. We love putting this educational content out there to our community. So thank you for spending your time with us. We are, as you probably already know, Party Center Software, and we are powered by Party Center Pay. And one of the most exciting things about Party Center Software is that we turn the frustrations of manual processes into a better guest experience for our customers. And our software, the beautiful Megan did this one, always makes me smile when I see you, Megan. Um, our software really enables people to make things easier for themselves. And our expertise is in the family entertainment center industry, but also the event booking industry. You need to book a party, you need to manage your facility or sign a digital waiver. We're the folks that would love to help you to do that. We offer many, many different options for different facilities, and we love working with a lot of a wide range of facilities, anywhere from trampoline parks, bowling alleys, shooting ranges, paintball facilities, mini golf, soft play, you name it. You, you guys all know. And Creative Works, man, they're the ones that make your facility look beautiful. So people want to come in and spend their money, spend their money, spend those dollars. So just to do some quick introductions, if we haven't met yet, my name is Rebecca Toomey. I'm the Director of Sales, Marketing, Customer Success here at Party Center Software. These are obviously some of our features, but we're not going to talk about that right now because we want to talk about the people that make it happen. And they're on this call. You won't be able to see them unless they talk, but they're here. Don't worry. I can see them. <laughs> so please say hi to them in the chat. We have Laura, who is our Marketing Manager. Laura, uh, I almost said Laura again, Megan, who is our lead customer success consultant and Courtney, who is also a customer success consultant. And of course we have our incredible CSM team, Eileen, Tanya, and Jesse. Please be sure if you're a PCS customer, say hi in the chat. They love to chat with you. If you have questions at any point during this webinar, please throw it into the Q and A. You'll see that on the little bottom bar. Most people, it pops up on the bottom says Q&A, put your questions in there. We will ask the question in real time. If it seems like that's the right time to ask the question, we might hold the question or we may respond to your question through chat. So just keep an eye and just know, but we wanna hear your questions. We want you guys to throw stuff at the team here. They have a lot to say and I know that they'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And if you need anything, there's also the chat. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass the rights over to the Creative Works team. We have Danny and Russ, and I would love for you guys to just tell folks a little bit about who you are and what you guys do and jump into things. Absolutely. So, hi everyone. Thank you so much for having us on. Hello to our PCS brethren and, and, and sisterhood. So that way we've got, we've got everything going. We are uh, with Creative Works. We'll hit some introductions. Then we're going to go and jump into some demographic analysis. So we can start looking at how are you guys going to start targeting these very specific age groups and what motivates them. We're also going to take a look at some consumer trends that we're seeing out in the marketplace based on some great data that we'll also have in some follow-up links that you guys can check out. 
Then we're going to talk about taking those two elements and starting to tailor what the guest experience can be across a number of different attractions. And then we'll open it up to some Q&A. Um, if there are questions that pop up, um, Rebecca, I may have you just kind of fire those off if they're relevant to the slide that we're on. Absolutely. And then anything that we don't get in, into in real time, we can circle back uh, around to just so that way we've got our notes and screen share and all the all the things happening. So Perfect. let's get into it. Um, Danny, why don't you start? Uh, well, before I get into who I am, I'll tell you, I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Creative Works, but um, to give you a little bit more information about what Creative Works does specifically is we create powerful emotions and memories through immersive attractions. We help operators like you get customers off the couch, get them into your center, and as uh, Rebecca said, getting them spending those dollars mm -hmm. for sure. That's what we want. So. Like I mentioned, my name is Danny. I'm the Vice President of Marketing. I have been in the entertainment industry for more than 13 years as both a vendor and an operator. So I kind of have both sides of that coin. Mm -hmm. um, I've been, um, I've spoken at multiple industry events, mm -hmm. written for different publications and magazines. I enjoy traveling and hiking with my wife and our dog. And a fun fact about me is I'm a self-published author. Yeah, you are. <laughs> yeah, you are. My man's deep over here is a, some some wonderful uh, collection of poetry that Danny has written that he has put out there. So um, check out Andiamo Books if you want to ever get Danny's published works. So um, hey, everybody, uh, for those of you that don't know, my name is Russ Van Natta. I'm the VP of Business Development at Creative Works. Um, you know, on, on top of Danny's piece that he, he talks about, I say we're kind of like Willy Wonka meets Ferrari when it comes to themed attractions and immersive experiences. And so we really want to come together and create these moments that will be lasting points in time for your guests as they come into your facility. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being in the industry for 10 years um, in a variety of different roles, both as an operator as well as um, a, a vendor from Creative Works. And uh, I've collaborated on the development of over, over 400 locations, which is um, a lot of fun and uh, a lot of time. But uh, I've been married for 12 years. My wife and I are actually expecting our first child here in just about six weeks. So it's, it's real. Um, I have a car seat base in the back of my car. My wife has like the baby go bags packed, like she's ready to rock and roll with this thing. And I'm, I'm still catching up uh, to what's, what's gonna happen to my life here in a little bit. So um, really looking forward to that. And then I also do things like in woodworking and some endurance events and, and those kinds of things. So, um, so let's jump in. I wanna start off with a poll question and um, our PCS team, if you guys don't mind publishing that, that'd be great. And so this launch is, what is the primary demographic of your facility? Ideally, you should have a primary demographic and a secondary. I just wanna focus on what this primary one is because it may help us tailor some of these content pieces a little bit more. We'll, we'll cover everything in full, but uh, if it's just overwhelmingly in one direction, we can start to, to massage that a little bit for you guys as you need to. Um, and uh, so your different options, there is now a generation alpha, y'all. It is the, the kids of the millennials, um, so 10 years and younger. Then you have your Gen Zers, which is that junior high, high school, early to, to college. Your millennials are in their mid 20s to late 30s, your Gen X to early 40s to mid 50s, and then your baby boomers in your mid 50s to your late 60s. Um, and so uh, feel free to take a moment, fill that out. That'll help us just get said. If, if it doesn't apply, then um, and because your facility isn't open yet, but you have an idea of which dem demographic you're likely to target as your primary, that's perfectly fine too. So we are at 65% of folks have voted. Okay. So please jump over. Ooh, we just jumped to 68. Please Ooh. jump over to this screen real quick, you guys, and just cast your vote. 75%. Ew. Yeah, we'll give you a couple more seconds. hundred <laughs> percent. We got to get to a hundred percent. Demand it. No. But what if they're not open? We'll give it the good eighty percent. Close enough, right? No. Okay, <laughs> that sounds good. All right, we're at seventy-eight. Can we? Can we get another one or two? Can I get a vote? Can we get a vote? Can I get a vote? <laughs> oh, we we crossed the threshold. We're at eighty-one percent. Oh, eighty-four <laughs> percent. Overachieving. All right, knock it off, everyone. All Next right, step. we're gonna end the poll, you guys, and I will share the results. So here's what we got: thirty percent, thirty-three percent is our highest one of millennials is okay. the primary demographic. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So it it looks like we've got a fairly even split. So. This is not unsurprising where uh, you've got millennials as a primary demographic and then this generation A as a, as a close second, um, specifically from the set fact that if generation A are the kids of your millennials and things like those, those elements will come 
um, kind of hand in hand as they're doing mm -hmm. mixed age family groups and things like that. So not, not unsurprising. We, up until recently, we saw very similar trends with Gen Z and Gen X as Gen Z are the kids of the Gen Xers. So um, it's, it's not, uh, not unsurprising, but yeah, I love this. And so this will be able to cover a kind of the different avenues or venues of this very cleanly for you guys as we explore it. So I appreciate you guys filling that out for us. Um, let me pop over to this next slide. And Danny, I'll have you kind of kick this off and, and we'll start talking about kind of group by group what we're seeing and, and how that's playing out for us. Exactly. So we're going to start with um, the, can you just scroll this back up just a oh, little sure. bit? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start with the Gen Z, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of that 10 to 24 four year old group. Now, fun fact about this. Uh, oftentimes, um, adults of a certain age like to complain about millennials, millennials this, millennials that. Mm -hmm. the, the interesting thing is that most of the time when uh, people do complain about the idea of millennials, it's often actually the Gen Z group. So mm -hmm. it's important to know there is a distinction mm -hmm. between each of these groups uh, with the, their behaviors, buying trends, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when we talk about um, this group, they're very entrepreneurial. Yeah, they're super tech savvy. Uh, they spend more than 10 hours a day on mobile devices, which that really shouldn't be a surprise to many of us. Because um, even as adults, I've constantly have this in my pocket and never leave my phone anywhere, right? <laughs> um, they're super self-directed. So this age group, they, they learn through a lot of self-directed models in schools. Mm -hmm. They're also very self-secure sure. um, and is a very diverse generation. Um, and as Russ also mentioned earlier, these are the children of Gen X. And so Gen X and Gen Z are tied very closely together. Um, and so the, the Gen Z actually has a, um, they're able to leverage um, significant buying power because it's not just their own. Mm -hmm. They have a, a significant amount of uh, influence on overall family spending. Mm -hmm. And so that's important to recognize that if you have that Gen X group that you're going to be going after or Gen Z, it's important to get buy-in from both sides because they have such heavy influence. Mm -hmm. um, now, I have a question I want to throw out to you if you want to throw this into the, the chat. We don't have an official poll for this, but um, we, when we talk about this group, we talk about mobile marketing. That's kind mm -hmm. of the, the key to accessing this group. What percentage do you think of Gen Z spends at least two hours a day on YouTube alone? What percentage of Gen Z do you think spends at least two hours a day? Go ahead and type that in the chat box at the bottom. Yeah. And then uh, Russ, could you yeah. bring up that chat box just so we can see what people are saying here? We're seeing 80%, one hour. It's not quite what we're looking for. 50, 50%, 80%, 80%, 60%, 75%. Yeah, so you yeah. guys are, are very close. So it's, uh, I'll, I'll let you, it's your statistic. You <laughs> it's my statistic it. trying to take over. Do your thing. Uh, so it's 70%. So if anyone who guessed basically above half that you're you're pretty right on. So uh, when we think about how how much that mm -hmm. uh, this generation spends on, on digital devices, and yeah. that's just YouTube alone, not to mention TikTok and Snapchat and everything else. Or is, is it TikTok or is it click clack? That's, that's Russ and his 80 year old self sometimes coming through. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. But when I had mentioned about the buying power is that they've got a combined buying power of um, 43 billion just as a group alone, mm -hmm. but they influence more than 600 billion in family spending um, and, and all those planned purchases. So it's mm -hmm. important to get from your marketing messages and the packages and things that you do, getting buy-in from both this group as well as their parents. Mm -hmm. So let's hit that next slide and go on to the next group here. Sure which is going to be millennials. Um, I am a millennial. I'm on the edge of, of kind of the older side of that a little bit. I'm a Gen Xer in a millennial's body because I have older sisters. They're all Gen X. So there you go. They beat it, it into me. So. I love it. So this is kind of that 24 to 39 year old, roughly in that range is, is what you're going to be looking at for millennials. Now, uh, some interesting things about them, they really value access over ownership. That's where you, 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 come with the popular, popularized, excuse me, things like Uber and ride sharing, mm -hmm. Airbnb, where you don't have to purchase a lot of these things. They just want the availability and the accessibility mm -hmm. to have it when they want, but they don't necessarily want to- They um, want the full overhead of, exactly. of having that. They want to be a little bit more flexible and, and not tied down to one direction, so. Exactly, and not the band, but yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> one direction. Yeah. Sorry, just had to drop that reference. Oh, I'm about to break into some boy band songs here. I love it. Okay, in sync, Backstreet sure. Boys. <laughs> okay, go ahead. 
we're getting way off topic. I love it. So, <laughs> so a lot of the people in this group are hitting their prime discretionary spending period, especially mm -hmm. as they start to mature more in the job market. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we think about um, uh, this group, they also very much appreciate wellness. Yes. And a lot of the uh, health conscious lifestyles mm -hmm. that have uh, come up more recently are all driven by this millennial market and the way that they view the importance of health and those sorts of things. Well, and they also look at the, the philanthropic kind of outreach that companies will do with that they choose to support. So it's, you know, whether it's, um, what is it, Tom's uh, that does the free pair of shoes for every pair of purchase that's done. So mm -hmm. a lot of those um, kind of philanthropic entrepreneurs uh, moments that are infusing into mainstream now are coming from a lot of that very conscientious purchasing decisions based on where, where they feel those companies that they're supporting are giving back. And so that's really important for you as a, as a facility as well is, okay, if you know that millennials are going to be a key piece for you, you know, are you advertising and promoting the, you know, the sports clubs uh, fundraisers that you're doing for the local schools or adopting families at, at uh, holiday times to be able to provide gifts? Like some of that, um, that moral fa fabric that you have within your company is a really great piece to bring out into the ether with your guests when you're focusing on millennials. Is a great point, very great point. And while this group spends uh, less in total dollars on out of home um, entertainment experiences than uh, another group, let's say like the boomers, the baby boomers, they spend a higher proportion, a bigger slice of the pie of the money that they do have, mm -hmm. uh, which is an important piece. And then we think about this is a big growth market. And you know, when we think about the things that have become really popular over time, like escape rooms and ax throwing and the punch bowl social styles of experiences, things like Top Golf, where it's it's a good mix of the food and beverage and the fun and the socialization. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is being driven by this group. And that's why it's exploded a lot in the past, you know, three to five years that we've seen some of these things. Absolutely. Well, and I think it's going to be really interesting when we look at Generation Alpha, the millennials kids coming on where you're still going to need, you know, because the millennial parents are going to infuse certain purchasing biases and things like that onto their kids, just like the Gen Xers have instilled that entrepreneurial spirit into the iGen, that's going to be really interesting to see what the younger uh, FEC models start to tailor and shift to based on knowing that the parents are of that millennial age group looking for more gamification, more technology, things like that. So All right, let's hit this next sure. slide here, talk about the next group, which is the Gen Xers. So as we mentioned before, parents of Gen Z, they're mm -hmm. roughly 40 to 55 year olds. Um, so here's another question for you. if you want to pop this in the chat. We don't have an official poll, but we'd love to see what you think on this. Um, so this group does favor stability. What percentage of Gen Xers do you think are working in the career that they intended when joining the workforce originally? So of, of this group, mm -hmm. what percentage uh, are still working in the career they originally intended when they joined the workforce? So you can go ahead and put that into the chat box here. We're sell wow, we're all over the place with some of these numbers. So Everything 20, 20, 35, 35, 70, 10. 40. Who said 40? Marcelo. No, Marcelo said 20. Sorry. Courtney and Phil. Phil, yes. You guys nailed it. 40%. 40%. Yeah. So they're working in that. And 25% uh, have been with the same employer for at least 15 years. And so when we look at that versus something like the millennial, this is where some of the darn millennial talk kind of got instilled was millennials will have an average of seven careers not jobs, but careers. So different venues and things that they'll be exploring. Uh, and so when you look at that versus this, where nearly half of these folks have been in the same career path um, and that they they have that longer tenure of 15 years, it's a pretty substantial um, psychological shift. It's not good versus bad. It's just, again, dealing with reality on reality's terms. So that way you can make the most out of how you're engaging with these folks. And so this was the first generation to really uh, take a significant push towards working to live and not living to work and mm -hmm. having more of that work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, they've been in their spending prime for a long time. And what's interesting is they spend more on their Gen Z children than they do on themselves, mm -hmm. which again is because those Gen Z kids have an influence on spending and the parents spend more on them anyway, mm -hmm. that tie between those two is very powerful and crucial to understand as you're developing positioning, mm -hmm. pricing packages, marketing, all those different pieces. For sure. Um, and they're also looking for a single experience start 
to finish. They don't want to run errands for their entertainment. They want to be able to have a lot of things in one location. Mm -hmm. And we'll hit on that a little bit more with some of the today's modern trends with the impact of the pandemic that we'll Mm -hmm. touch on later in this presentation as well. Sounds great. So we'll hit on the last group here, which is going to be the baby boomers. So this is basically mid 50s to mid 70s um, from an age standpoint. So they spend the most by volume um, on or total dollars spent on the out of home entertainment. Mm -hmm. Uh, They spend a lot on their kids and grandkids. um, And uh, sorry, I lost myself in my notes here. They're also the wealthiest of all the generations. Mm -hmm. And when we think about how much they they have in their discretionary spending annually Mm -hmm. is a combined $548 $548 billion. Mm-hmm. So when we think about that, a lot of times when we build entertainment centers, we're not necessarily targeting uh, baby boomers per se, mm-hmm. but when we think about the fact that they're spending on their grandkids mm-hmm. and we can uh, have family outings, potentially things like that, it's important to keep those pieces in mind. Mm-hmm. Um, they're also pretty entrepreneurial. So uh, 80% of them have launched, ven- uh, excuse me, launched their own uh, ventures as a way to become independent from the typical corporate structure that mm-hmm. they grew up in for so long um, and kind of produ- pursue their own interests and increase their own income. Mm-hmm. Um, they're also, uh, they take a very long time to make purchasing decisions and they're very well researched mm-hmm. uh, when they do. So they're very highly informed buyers regardless of what they're going to spend. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things that we're gonna start taking a look at some of the different uh, consumer trends by age, income, and education, some of these types Mm -hmm. of things. So if you wanna hit the next slide, Russ. So what's important right now is, uh, especially right now in the pandemic, is that consumers are gonna be returning to the marketplace and location-based entertainment, but it's going to be really important for them to focus on uh, brands that are convenient and brands that they trust. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is taken from some of the uh, data that we've um, kind of dived into on from places like McKinsey and Deloitte and a bunch of other consulting institutions, not just for location-based entertainment, Mm -hmm. but for just getting out and about regardless of where they're going. Mm -hmm. And so uh, convenience and brand trust are going to be extremely important when um, when we're bringing those customers back into our center. Um, And so guests are going out and they're socializing in small groups, Mm -hmm. right, where they get to be able to go to one location in a small group, spend time there. Again, they don't because there is a little bit of a hesitation to go go out as often. Mm-hmm. They're not gonna be hitting multiple spots on an evening out. They wanna be able to go to one spot, yeah. stay there for a while with their friends. It's been an interesting flip that we've seen, you know, prior to um, the pandemic and everything, we saw this convenience factor as a lot of, it was proximity and it was consolidation of different elements. So that way they didn't have to run their errands for it. And now while that still can remain true, really what we've seen during the pandemic pieces is that because there has been this kind of fear of going out or perce- higher perceived risks and things like that. At, at various points, it's, it's been higher than others. Um, and I shouldn't say perceived risk, but, but you guys understand what I'm talking about with that, where depending on what, what hot spots are happening in your market and things like that, if you are going to go out, you don't want to have to be going to a lot of different places and, and doing a lot more people. You want to keep that you know, contained. And so still having an ecosystem of a variety of profit centers that are throughout that space is now where it was more convenience. It's also a little bit of, of assurance you know, mm-hmm. as well that's getting blended in with the current times. And something that's important to remember with the idea of convenience, uh, when I say that, it doesn't mean make our uh, entertainment venues transactional. Convenience mm-hmm. is just removing friction. Like what a lot of a lot of what Party Center Software does is about removing friction and making things easier for your customers. Yeah. And that's what you want to be doing here because we are an entertainment experience. We're mm-hmm. service-based industry. We're human-driven. We're not trying to remove any of that. We yeah. just want to make it easier so that our staff can create those experiences for the customers that do come in the door. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you think about ways to build the trust, uh, one is going to be uh, some of the things that Russ had mentioned before about the idea of philanthropy and, and, and tying some of these things in with your company why in your mm-hmm. messaging. Why are you an entertainment brand? Because we're not in this industry to, to make money. There has to be more than that. You can mm-hmm. do any job to make money. But for us, like at Creative Works, mm-hmm. our, our why is creating powerful emotions and memories and mm-hmm. those amazing experiences. That kind of why needs to be driven into all of your marketing messaging mm-hmm. and everything that you do. Mm-hmm. And another way that you can um, build that trust is 
keep your promises, especially right now. Mm -hmm. You know, if you make certain promises and claims about the cleanliness of your facility, how often you're sanitizing spaces, what the experience is going to be like when they walk in the door, mm -hmm. and that's all talk. And when they get there, it's something completely different. You've just uh, just destroyed that level of trust that you could have built otherwise. Mm -hmm. So right now, keeping the promises, especially when it comes to sanitation and cleanliness, mm -hmm. is absolutely crucial. And then in, when we get to the next slide, Russ is going to also hit on some of the pieces when we think about um, as customers are coming back, it's not just about getting customers in the door, it's mm -hmm. segmenting them into multiple groups of the early adopters, mm -hmm. the majority and the laggers, and how that can impact the way that you need to provide the experience and how they can be word of mouth for you as well. Yeah. It's interesting, some additional segmentation that you start to see because you'll have early adopters throughout all of those major demographics that we talked about, those, those key four. And you'll have um, kind of first wave mainstream, second wave mainstream, as well as laggers that again, span this very quickly, uh, very evenly um, in a variety of ways. And so it's interesting to see some of those universalities across the different age groups, but also specifically like which ones are, are kind of peaking or, or spiking in certain areas. Because again, that's where, uh, again, knowledge isn't power, it's the actual implementation of knowledge that is power. And so you can have these pieces of information at hand, but unless you're actually fine tuning or adjusting what your approach is to leverage those pieces of information, um, that would be for naught. And so we want you guys to, to be able to actually start thinking of how can we use this. And so one of the things that I would highly encourage you guys is uh, you may have offhand, like, oh yeah, our, our primary customer are millennials all day long. Like, I would challenge that you guys also do a little bit of internal survey and research and, and actually analyze some of that because you may be surprised sometimes that those assumptions, there's always this, a little bit of this bias of, you know, we are our customers to a certain extent that you have to be uh, aware of and that you don't become kind of nose blind to over time at, if, if that changes. The other thing that may happen is that you may start open as a facility with a millennial and generation alpha as your primary and secondary demographic, but then your local market it may shift um, from what those population densities and numbers look like. So you may need to adjust in four years to a new demographic based on how, you know, what's going on. Are people moving in? Are people moving out? Are they, you know, are new schools opening? All of that. So this is not something where it's like, well, when we did that feasibility study seven years ago, this is what it was and, and we're good to go. Like, look at the county auditing information, see how those things are evolving so that way you can then make sure that you're appropriately finding the right mediums and messaging um, to engage with those folks. Absolutely, Russ. I just wanted to jump in. We, we do have a quick question sure. that's referring back, but I also wanted to make a quick comment that if somebody's looking to do this quickly and easily, use your, use your digital waivers. Pull mm -hmm. those dates and sort them out, and you can really get a good view of who is walking through your door from just the information and data that you already have. And you may already be you're, you may be talking about that in the future. So sorry. <laughs> Question um, from Todd: What was the Gen Z dollar amount they influence? Yes, yeah, six hundred billion in family spending. Billion with a B. Mm -hmm. And that's with their their combined family spending with mm -hmm. the Gen Xs. So they they alone have forty three billion just mm -hmm. all by themselves. Uh, but when because there is such a direct link in how those family decisions are made now, it's much more collaborative. Um, whereas opposed, like you know back in the day, your dad's like we're going to the circus and like that that's what you're doing. This now is no, it's much more of this collaboration of what are we going to do. So Elaine, uh, Elaine, I'm glad you like that one. Um, so let's pop back and uh, thank you for that, Rebecca. Feel free to interject those as we hit. So we'll be, we'll be happy to do that. Um, so again, we are in this great time now and, and we've talked about, we've started to set the stage for this towards the end of last year, but now we're starting to see um, the thawing kind of take place within our market. And so I really want you guys to, to look at this of, you know, this is our opportunity to relaunch, even if it's the same attractions and it's everything else, like as folks are coming back in and consumer confidences are shifting to be more comfortable, spending more time and, and more frequency, this is a wonderful way for you guys to, um, you know, just again, and really lock on and, and refocus some of these efforts. Uh, so, you know, the saying is where focus goes, energy flows. And so you guys need to be focusing on what this relaunch is going to look like and, and what the strategies are going to be for that, as well as tailoring some of your experiences that are going on. So, um, again, you have the ability to tailor the second first impression with your guests as they're coming back in. Um, a lot of that is, is going to come down to very um, kind of consistent vision of what your social um, 
um, media marketing and messaging is going to look like, um, who, it, which, what post is geared towards your primary demographics, which posts are geared towards secondary demographics. It's not just, well, we're sending this to everyone. Like you're not doing PSAs or office memos that nobody's going to read. You are crafting very specific measurements or a, a messaging rather that are tailored with either keywords or calls to action that will resonate with these groups. And so that's why that first part where we're talking about what motivates the, the base layer, the foundational elements of these different groups. And again, there is nuance. So don't feel like we're painting with an overly broad brush. I mean, everybody has, has those influences that change that. But again, it's just, are we being more intentional and specific about the messaging that we're crafting? Who, what persona type or demographic type am I actually crafting this for? And is this the right method and message for it? And so we'll talk about some of the uh, early adopters and majority and laggers as we get into what we're seeing as far as industry trends uh, with regards to intent spend. And so this was a piece that was done by McKinsey and Company survey. They um, originally did one in April. They updated it in June and October and, and then again recently. And so one of the post uh, webinar links that we'll do is a link to this survey just because it was so, so well done um, and they collaborated across the board. So one of the big things that you do see is that you have a small percentage, uh, you know, one fifth uh, or 19% or that is only going to be resuming normal activities once there is a vaccine or treatment and the clarifier to that is that once that has been dispersed through the majority of the population. So once that's had a chance to take um, success, you have a, an equal group that is, oh, okay, well, once the government restrictions lift, I'm okay with being out there as long as I'm taking, you know, kind of reasonable precautions. Um, or, and then here you have government restrictions and I'm also seeing either medical authorities deeming this safe, stores and restaurants are still taking additional safety measures and you see other people returning. So this is a nice kind of breakdown as far as where folks can be. Um, I think it's very encouraging that we are still seeing, again, like the, the smallest group is this one where there is only a vaccine, so you're not totally dependent. Those are gonna be your laggers, right? Those are gonna be your very conservative folks that are gonna come late to the party because they, they just are, are much more risk averse. Um, you have your um, you have your kind of early adopters that are like, once the government gets out of my way on this, I'm going and playing Big Buck Hunter for days. And then you have these other folks that are kind of in between, and, and it makes sense, right? It fits that kind of typical bell curve that we would expect to see, that you have kind of the first stage of the, the main bell curve that are really doing this based on um, either the medical authorities are deeming it safe or I'm seeing you know reasonable precautions being taken. So you're seeing that standard bell curve of adoption being broken down here in this pie chart kind of very nicely and consistently. One thing I'd like to add to that is when you think about the early adopters, you mm -hmm. want them to be, after they visit your center, your brand champions mm -hmm. because the amount of influence they can have on word of mouth marketing mm -hmm. um, or posting on social media is very powerful. So if you can find ways of these early adopters, the first customers that are coming in your door and encouraging them to post about it on social media, share with their friends, tell other people, that will go a long way as well. Cause you can see a chunk of those, uh, of that um, uh, majority is waiting to see if other people are returning. And if they can see, oh, my friend says it was safe. So I, I think maybe it's safe for us too. Mm -hmm. That's gonna go a long way as well. For sure. Um, so we'll keep going here, Rebecca, if there are any questions, it looks like I posted a question, but I didn't post a question. So I don't know how I did that. Um, or if there's Your another- Your ghost posted there. a question. So, huh? <laughs> I said your ghost posted a question. Yeah, that's right. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Funny. Um, maybe it, maybe it's Nick or Athena that are logged in on one of our other Zoom accounts. So, um, all righty. So then what I want to show next on this slide is an intent to spend by age. And so you'll see I've got the Gen Zs, the Millennials, uh, the Gen Xers, and the Baby Boomers. And then these different bars represent, um, you know, when are you expecting to go back out into location-based entertainment? And, um, and so right now, this was done back in October and we're actually seeing the numbers are better. Um, they, have, they have done better than what these initial pieces were expected. Um, so again, like Gen Z, 20% was gonna do one month. Um, over th nearly 35% or a third was gonna be at three months. And then um, you're looking at six months, uh, roughly there around 20%. And so again, we're kind of now getting into that six month range based on when this was originally posited. 
And so we are getting much more into this. These We haven't seen much of a retraction in the intentions of these things because we're seeing, uh, again, you as business operators have either taken great pains to introduce additional proactive measures to help that. And so again, as we're seeing the bell curve and we're seeing that one, their desire to come out as well as the, um, the proper signals that they're seeing out in the marketplace for them to feel safe returning are really starting to coalesce. And now we're gonna be seeing really the upward tick um, across the board. So again, you do see um, kind of a, a fairly even distribu distribution. I think Gen Z, you see slightly where their, um, you know, their six plus month piece was a little bit lower, um, but then every all the other ones kind of, you know, you see these things relatively within the same range of slight nuances, but this will be helpful pieces for you guys. Um, some of these pieces, again, will be in the um, link that we'll send out afterwards so that way you guys can dive in. There's there's way more on that report than what I'm even bringing to the table. So you guys can nerd out hard on some statistics. But one thing I will caution with you guys is as you look at these things, you really need to look at the nuance of particularly how a question is being asked, what things they're they're bringing in. Because again, it's, it's never by malintent, but those, you know, an average doesn't really tell me a story. I, I need to see, you know, that just tells me you know, a, a very limited scope of as a piece of data because it doesn't take into account different ends of the spectrum and, and how much are there and, and how that's actually dispersed. So when you guys are looking at data, try and find more segmented specific pieces of data so that way you can really start to see trends um, as how those trends are transverse from age group to age group. Um, and so again, very pleased that we are actually surpassing what some of these initial projections were um, and excited for what that means for us in the industry. Uh, the other piece that isn't in here that I would like to share is we work with a number of private equity firms um, that do investments into entertainment properties, and they are still very, very active um, and engaged and excited about our industry. And so the, the financial institutions, both private equity, as well as now with small business associations getting 95% guaranteed backing from the federal government for small businesses, SBA loans, you see a lot of this now where the lending institutions realize, okay, great, we can, we can start opening these up or we can start fast tracking some of these projects again um, because you know, there is PPP that's getting back out there for the phase two. There are better federal guarantees. And so that will also help put you guys in a position where you'll have more dollars to be able to, to go after to keep things moving the way that you see fit. Um, and so Danny, I'll kick this over to you as we now will start to look at how do we take these, this, all these numbers and make it into something that's actually real and a tangible experience? And, and what are the kind of lanes that we would like to, to take to get to those different destinations? Yeah, so it's kind of setting the stage here is, is um, there's no formula that says do this attraction plus this attraction plus this attraction equals success. Right. There are if there was a formula like that, it would I mean, I would have cracked that Da Vinci code. Exactly. A long time ago. There, there's a lot of different pieces when it comes to um, your your region, your market, mm -hmm. your goals, your demographics, all these different things play a part. So it's about trying to figure out, OK, based upon our demographics, primary and secondary, what attractions uh, fit our vision. Mm -hmm. When we look at the competition in the area, what else is here and what are the things that we need to do to stand out? Mm -hmm. We can't just copy and replicate what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. That may not mean success because if you're going to do that, you have to go far above and beyond what they're doing in order to be able to capture that audience. Mm -hmm. um, how much space do we need to allocate in our center for different types of pieces mm -hmm. based upon what we're going to be spending on those, what the throughput's going to be, what right. the revenue potential is, mm -hmm. um, how much money does it make, what's the profitability, yeah. um, how do we start piecing all this together in a way that we wouldn't have one attraction cannibalize another, mm -hmm. we want them to be complementary where it's a one plus one equals three, mm -hmm. right? Where when we can have um, a certain, like our lucky putt uh, golf attraction that we have is all built up for millennials and a social experience and to be able to increase food and beverage spend while they're in there. Kind mm -hmm. of like thinking of the top golf model, yeah. right? Yeah. There are ways that you can combine different pieces together in order to get the whole to be greater than the sum of all of its parts. I was just getting ready to say, that's when you start to get into that one plus one equals three mentality, because again, it's like, okay, well, they have an arcade, we have an arcade, they have food and beverage, we have food and beverage. It's like, great. And, and so those, it's not necessarily that you have a big bass wheel and they have a big bass wheel that's that's going to be a thing, but it's, okay, how are you staffing that? Are you having people regularly keep things up and running? Is your arcade larger and are you doing more video games and things like, mm -hmm. how are you fine tuning those specific things based on it? As well as, okay, well, if I start bringing in, 
you know, this VR component or this dark ride or this ropes course or other things that, that now I can get a very different experience of a different group, you know, blend of, of things. Because again, if they're average coming into our facilities two to three times a year pre-COVID, and now we're seeing those numbers, um, they, they are moving back towards that. Is So when they come here the first time, I want them to hit the three of these five elements that I have for them. But when they come the second time, I want them to hit the other two that they didn't plus the food and beverage again. And so are you building in a unique combination of attractions that resonate well with the age groups that you're targeting, as well as are you creating enough things that they can't do it when they're all there in one sitting and that it naturally draws them back in to come and experience the different combinations or orders of your attractions uh, to keep it fresh. So um, one of the things, let's pop in and, and let's start getting after it with some of these things because these are the fun pictures. Yeah, we, you don't have to look at us anymore. You can look at the fun pictures, right? It's more, more interesting than text. Uh, so here's yeah. just a couple examples of pieces, right? When we think about one of the most common and honestly most profitable parts of any entertainment center mm -hmm. is the arcade with the redemption piece, mm -hmm. right? And so there are different ways, like Russ had just said, well, just because someone else has an arcade doesn't mean you can't do it. Uh, it's a matter of what's the layout, what are the types of games, how big is it? Mm -hmm. um, and then on the redemption side, it's also thinking about, well, am I catering to a more of an adult audience or more of a, a kid audience? Mm -hmm. So if we look here on the right side uh, of this redemption store, you can see based upon a lot of these a lot um, of plushes, a lot, lot of, of plushes, candy. yes, candy, things like that. This is definitely geared toward a younger demographic, kids and children. Mm -hmm. But if this were to be something geared more toward adults, this mm -hmm. would be looking a bit more like sharper image, if you will, where yeah. it's going to be a lot more of the high-end electronics pieces, yep. um, headphones, things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a great example of pieces that are going to, to kind of shift up that age demographic a little bit easier um, and be more enticing to the age group. So it's not just arcade with redemption, there's many nuances within that that's important Very to pay much. attention to. Yeah, and you saw in both of these, like both of those examples that you saw on either slide are good examples of a redemption store. There's lit elements, like here you see these cubes with some items that are a little bit more premium that are actually locked up. The other one had some light boxes. So that redemption store is still something that's very much there. It's just what and how are you stocking the, the different redemption pieces? And so again, you know, Dave and Busters are gonna have more of those drones and those air fryers and, and more of the appliance kind of pieces um, as opposed to so many of the plushes. This one you can see is, is probably a very much a mixed age family group where we've got some um, sports equipment, we've got darts, we've got some higher end electronics and we still have the plushes. And so again, your partners that help you dictate all of that based on your demographics and your feasibility study, they will help you shape what some of those are. But again, this is, it's, I just, I'm now being very intentional as far as what I'm putting where and how based on who my primary demographic is. So that way it's just, again, removes that, you know, it removes a little bit of friction and we start to get a compounding effect of the more that I can hone this into what will resonate with my primary and secondary demographics, the longer, the, the more frequent they'll come to my facility facility, the longer amount of time that they'll spend there and therefore more dollars per capita that they will spend as well. And so it's really just engineering that formula of, of how you can get them to stay in that two plus hours kind of time frame because you start to see a major jump in per capita spending once you get them past two hours and 20 minutes. Um, and so let's look at something like laser tag. You know, laser tag has been around for gosh, 30 plus years now. And it started off as this high tech dodgeball, very simplistic piece. And then it, we, you know, um, we've done a ton with story driven and immersive theming and, and crazy over the top. But again, it's even going to be things like if I'm, this is a, a project that we did here in Indianapolis called Woodland Bowl. It is designed for, um, you know, they have a, an arcade and laser tag and some virtual reality, but then they have 70 lanes of bowling. And those of you that are out there, you know, 70 lanes of bowling is just freaking insane. Nobody does it anymore. Everyone does like 24 to 30 lanes because you want to create an hour long wait time. But uh, Woodland Bowl does a ridiculous amount of tournaments and leagues like they have all of the state stuff like all the big bowling gatherings are at Woodland Bowl and they needed this flex space to be able to capture all of the kids that weren't bowling and keeping them kind of contained and, and creating an entertaining babysitter um, kind of formula for this. And so for this one, we took a lot more of the vibrant um, glow colors and, and pops and things. We still have some really cool visual elements, don't get me wrong, but it just the color palette and the styles and choices, we skewed much more towards a, a younger audience. Whereas if we look at another bowling facility, such as an Andretti's, this is the one in uh, Murrieta, Georgia, 
shifts and where their primary focus within the FEC, they still have bowling and they have all of these other things, but both their bowling and their entertainment, uh, other entertainment elements are all geared towards that young, more corporate business. They're looking towards the millennials. And so they're picking a theme that has more um, kind of destruction and, and explosions and intensity and things. And so even when we look at the theming choices on an attraction, that can be a major choice. Color palettes, intensity, um, again, the, the style. So again, we can do a Black Panther and Wakanda theme thing if you've got younger kiddos, but that will do well in, in a variety of settings. And, and neither one of these will preclude you from the other group. So let's say you start and lean towards more adult. Kids will come in here and play this as well and enjoy it. I call it the Nerf mentality where the average user of a Nerf gun is nine to 11, but you never see anybody younger than 15 on the box. And so you want to show uh, you know, older kids doing it and they see that and they like it. It's the same reason why the swipe card systems are so popular with the younger kids too. So you can, again, you don't have to completely alienate what your secondary market is going to be. You just need to know which one do we really need to put forth as the main one so that way we can tailor this. Because even within ex an experience like laser tag, you can you know, have this where kids are gonna come and have their birthday party. You're gonna have seven and eight year olds hanging out in here on a Saturday morning, but then I'm gonna run different types of games I'm going to run different intensities of special effects. And so I may be running, um, you know, for an adult thing, I may be running more things like um, solo missions, mini team games like capture the flag and elimination and zone control, like what you would see on Call of Duty. Whereas with the younger groups in, in earlier in the day, the actual game experience itself, I'll probably shift that to be much more broad, large, like red versus blue, um, you know, kind of broader scope. So that way it's it's not, okay, well, when I'm in this part of the arena and I have to tag the helicopter over here and that trigger this thing over there, like you're, I don't need them to be doing deductive reasoning, you know, if you're six years old and playing laser tag, not that it can't be immersive and engaging, but we're just thinking about that. And then as we get into our older groups, we're going to be running zombie and we're going to be running more of those intense game styles as well. So aesthetic and functionality both come into um, something like this that you guys should look at. And it's not just about the game type either. When yeah. you think about like the busy Saturday and Sunday with the birthday parties, it's also about throughput and efficiency yes. because when you have a game of 30 10 to 14 year olds you don't want to spend 15 minutes explaining to them how to do capture the flag or how to do an elimination game mm -hmm. you just want them to go in there and be able to shoot stuff that's glowing yeah. right you just want to be able to to turn the games over not mm -hmm. spend a lot of time between them because mm -hmm. if you do you get behind schedule and it just kind of all collapses mm -hmm. from there and then when you get into the evenings where you don't have as many birthday parties mm -hmm. but your regulars will be coming back on a regular basis well they want variety in their games because they're coming and doing an you know all access pass uh you know at least once a month or something and, and spending some real time in your facility. Um, so again, it's, it's all of this is on the table, but if we're not looking at tracing it all back to who is the main group that I'm trying to get in first, who's going to get me the most money and that I can provide the best experience for, who's the secondary group. And so how do I then shift these attractions to, to be able to work for me in either direction as I need them to? Um, it's just pre-planning that type of flexibility and functionality into it. Um, let me hit this next slide. So then we have something like bumper cars. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so a, a lot of this goes um, beyond just like, what is a bumper car? Well, it's just this little kind of go-kart thing mm -hmm. with pads and you go around and hit each other, yeah. right? But we're all about delivering experiences mm -hmm. in this industry and it's all about creating something over the top and wow. Mm -hmm. And so when you think of something like a spin zone bumper car, right? It's about having extra uh, effects lighting, having extra um, music and sound effects, mm -hmm. uh, being able to bring in technologies that uh, technology that enhances the experience mm -hmm. and it can radically transform what you're trying to offer. And one thing about technology that we will say, and I think we might hit on this a little bit later yeah. too, is that technology for technology's sake is never the answer. It has to be intentional. It has mm -hmm. to be with purpose. Yes. It has to either do uh, hopefully at least two of these. And if you're doing well, all three of making it um, more immersive, mm -hmm. more story driven, mm -hmm. or more social. Mm -hmm. Those three things, if you can hit those pillars when it comes to the technology integration, yeah. that's, that's really going to take it to the next level. For sure. And so again, it's, it's, Customers have now become sophisticated and the quality of offerings that are out in our marketplace now, I mean, you're just, you're not going to, they're not going to suffer fools, right? They're going to be able to perceive this value. And one of the things like this, where this may be a younger skewing facility that has a more entry level style of bumper car in it. But then if I have something where I do want a more sophisticated gamified version of bumper cars alone, 
Well, then you have something like the Laser Fury piece, you know, and so these are both from amusement products. So they mm -hmm. do the spin zone and they do the Laser Fury, but it's great because now I have this full hamster wheel mechanized gyroscopic mm -hmm. um, craziness that not only happens when I'm bumping in and people are spinning around, but now I'm actually tagging back and forth with a laser tag-esque type of an experience mm -hmm. that's in there and flipping that around. And again, this is just a more intensified experience. It's got a little bit more adrenaline, a little mm -hmm. bit more razzle dazzle, a little bit of a different um, street appeal or curb appeal to it mm -hmm. because it's for a different demographic that's that's in there. But again, you can also see middle, you know, that that Gen Z group is going to have just as much fun as this, but Generation Alpha is probably not going to be overly wild about this unless you've just got a kid that's, you know, going to be a, a future stuntman. But there's there's kind of warm up elements to what some of this can be. And it's also the, the overall footprint and the number of, of people that you're putting into an experience at both times as well um, that get into that. So. Uh, so escape rooms, I mean, Danny, this is a perfect example of an intense, gritty looking escape room. This is our cell block E that we've done where this is designed for that larger group of millennials or corporate business. Um, it's a longer 60 minute experience with more complicated puzzle configurations. But when we look at something like um, our other escape rooms, like Mayday, for example, here on the left, that, that is it's a 30 minute experience. It's not as long. Uh, it's more for those mixed age family groups. Again, adults will be able to go and have a great time in this and, and it is fluid where you can move back and forth. But we just did a webinar yesterday with the hoax and they were talking about how, okay, well, when we did our, our autonomous room, that 30 minute experience of May Day versus the 60 minute version of the cell block E, they were having a, like mixed age family groups and younger guests were all preferring the May Day and the shorter experience, whereas the corporate business and, and the more intense stuff or the older skewed groups were leaning more towards the longer experience too. Yeah, and it allows you to also uh, be able to capture an audience that maybe would be too intimidated by mm -hmm. either the time commitment or the price mm -hmm. of a 60 minute escape room if they've never done an escape room before. Mm -hmm. And having something shorter of that 30 minute time period with a slightly lower cost, not cut in half, mm -hmm. uh, but just a slightly lower cost, allows you to capture more of that market that maybe hasn't done it before. Yeah. Um, and really increases the throughput and the revenue capabilities of something like that. Absolutely. And the one thing that I put on here was this, you know, this is not a, a kindergarten room, but this is a, a picture of a, a much younger focused, it's almost like a play expo exploration room. It's not what I would typically classify as a true escape room, uh, but they are starting to do some things for that 10 and under group that can have some of these types of things. It's almost some stuff that you'd see in the children's museum, you know, where it's, it's looking at that. One thing that I will caution on is, is we have not delved into this specifically um, with the intentionality because you have developmental milestones that change very frequently as kids grow and, and as they age. And so this is gonna be one of those things where it is so narrowly focused, where it is very intentional for a very specific age range. But as soon as you get outside of that, it really loses its application. Whereas, you know, the May Day is something where it's like, okay, I can have a younger kid be part of a mixed age family group with their parents there and still have things to do and contribute to this. Whereas this like, I mean, dad would play this, but he's going to need a beer either before, during, or after doing this thing, you know, if it's, if it's been a long day. And so it's, it's just not going to be quite the same piece. And so who really has the money versus who's making the decisions and, and how do you find that blend? So there's no wrong way to do it. It's just when you start looking at the fringe edges of, of how, where this can go, you also want to make sure that you're aware and cognizant of the fact that that's a very specific application of what this can be. So... Um, let's hit get at axe throwing. Get out your waivers. Yeah, boy. <laughs> so we had mentioned earlier that something like axe throwing, which is all built around the idea of having fun and in a social experience. And mm -hmm. it can be something as simple as, yes, you've just got boards up and you're throwing axes and doing things like that. But mm -hmm. one of the things that we can do from an operational standpoint is really create an amazing experience for the guests by having the employees running this area. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we did a couple of years ago, this was before the pandemic hit, several of the people from our company and our leadership team went out and we did an axe throwing uh, kind of get together after it was work. so much fun. And, uh, you know, you could have given us a beer and an axe and said throw, we would have had fun. Yeah, and we were we competitive did. enough that it would have 
that would have been enough by itself. But what they did, and we had, um, and he called himself Pork, Pork Chop. Chop. That was his name. He was um, kind of the the person guiding us on this axe throwing journey. Mm -hmm. He made it an experience. Everything so had good. a everything had a story. It was all tied around their like Norse Viking. Norse mythology Viking theme. Yeah. Everything had a story, and he was able to also read the audience and could see. Well, we're all adults. We're having fun. He could be a little bit more mm -hmm. fast and loose with his jokes, and could keep them a little bit more adult oriented. Yeah. Um, and he made he made the experience oh, what it was so good I, it's it's those of you that are open and you have the just those killer birthday party hosts that are like always they get down on their knees and talk with the kids or you have the other mm -hmm. ones where it's like uh okay we've got a bachelor party coming in through like danny you're gonna have to work with them because it's gonna be real bro time with them and so you can start to to look at how this can go one of the interesting things about axe throwing is we predominantly look at this as an older skewing demographic of as as this and in this iteration yes that is very much the case just from safety and everything else but you're now starting to see, just like we did with climbing walls and other elements, like there is projection mapping and um, augmented reality-esque type technologies that are starting to, to come out where you can make this a little bit more um, kid, kid friendly or younger demographic friendly uh, in order to start doing some of that. And so there will, again, technology will always help us further and reinvent known elements. It's just, does that make the most sense for what we're trying to do? Our kid, like, our kids having a younger attention span because they're not going to be sitting there drinking either a beer or a glass of wine while they're doing their axe throwing. Mm -hmm. Is their attention span or willingness to stay and do that same length of an experience going to be there? Or do we have to shrink that knowing that their attention span is shorter? So um, let us hit our next slide. And so mini bowling has a mm -hmm. couple of options that can skew nicely for young and older demographics alike. Yeah, bowling has been one of those staple pieces in entertainment centers for a long time. And now mm -hmm. entertainment centers today, as you mentioned before, are putting in fewer lanes than they did in the right. past. Uh, but it's still a staple. But sometimes uh, entertainment venues don't have the space um, or or the, the budget to put in full lanes because it does require a lot more space. You can mm -hmm. do something like these mini bowling experiences, which is what we like to call a, a hybrid attraction mm -hmm. because you can use swipe cards like an arcade game, but it's much more involved in a longer an experience than what a sure. typical arcade game would be. So you get this really good hybrid piece and a mix between the two. Um, and then some of the other things that are coming with bowling is yes, it, it, you have the traditional like I can go and I can play traditional bowling that mm -hmm. sort of thing, but then you had things like Cubica AMF and their hyper bowling piece where it is all about the projection mapping mm -hmm. onto the lanes themselves and creating more games and almost doing like the the top golf style of experience where you can have people at top golf who don't um, necessarily know how to play golf or are not good but can still compete with others because it's a, a low barrier to entry of playing these different types of games mm -hmm. and that's the way that you can introduce technology to enhance the experience rather than introducing it just to have technology. Absolutely. And in these two slides that you'll see, one is geared towards the younger kiddos, obviously, because they're playing. But it's going to be, again, color palettes. It's got more texture going on with the lanes themselves versus one that is skewed more towards a uh, older demographic, which is going to be a little bit cleaner. It has more of that traditional bowling look to it. It's more actual TVs and live broadcast and all of that. So again, same core attraction where I can now shift this and, and be able to apply it to multiple pieces because again, LED lighting and accenting and things like what content I'm putting up on those screens, I can still take this and be able to skew it down in age and keep it at the primary demographic as well. So again, there is always an option for you guys to be able to tailor and, and blend this because that's really what's going to, you, you're not gonna be able to be all things to all people, but you are going to intentionally provide a great experience for the demographics that you're focusing on and paying attention to. And something like that could also very easily, easily be placed right next to your bar. So oh, they yeah. can order appetizers, have a server coming around with drinks exactly. and encourage a longer stay. Absolutely. And so that's another great point, Danny, is where are we putting certain elements based on what demographic it is? And so if I have an arcade piece that is more adult focused and I've got more of like the pinball machines, both the retro and the new modern ones and things like that, I'm going to kick that back over to the actual bar, or put it closer there, because that's where folks are going to want to post up, have have quarters or, or their swipe card ready and have a beer or two while they play that um, or if it's if it's mini bowling or something like that so again 
where that directional flow will happen is very important also. And so um, as we kind of get into these last pieces, we'll, we'll kind of hit on this quickly because it's, it's similar veins of what we've talked about. So when you look at virtual reality or dark rides, again, the titles, the variety within the library that you have is going to allow you to do kid games in the morning and, and then more intense games in the afternoon. And so that's a great versatile piece. So the what I love about these kind of uh, technologies is that it's one core fundamental attraction that now you can slot in a variety of different experiences uh, at a different level than what you have done with laser tag, let's say with different game types, this has truly different elements to it and eventually laser tag will will be in that market as well as we do more free roam and things like that. But again, it just comes down to, you know, if it's if it's 9am and I'm doing this with this this group, I'm going to be doing cold clash for the young birthday parties. But then I'm going to go over into alien asteroid on my dark ride at, you know, 330 in the afternoon because I've got a different set of kids that are in my um, group there. And so I can, you know, it's, it's, I've got 15, 16 year olds that are going to be in. And, um, and so I can DJ what that guest experience is going to be like in a variety of ways. And so that's a really critical piece as far as just, again, being intentional and, and paying attention to how that stuff migrates and changes over the course of a day at different times of the year. And esports, the last one that we'll, we'll talk about this because we want to leave some time for Q&A since we're kind of here at the hour mark is Esports in general are awesome because if you're focusing this on Gen Z, you can have the same infrastructure. You can focus this on Gen Z with school programs from like 3 to 5 p.m. Monday through Thursday, where the school, because you have over 560 universities that have scholarships and club programs and, and that higher level, the junior highs and high schools are scrambling like crazy to create these programs for them to feed up into it. And so they're going after grants and they're not going to spend that grant money on building out another computer lab. Uh, they're going to offset that and do it at a much more cost effective price of using your center as their home field for these school tournaments and leagues and things. It's driving traffic to a low uh, period throughout the week at, in that, that piece. And then when you're ready to switch over to your millennials, which is, is where your core demographic of gaming really can be because your average gamer is 35 and has been playing for 14 years. Mm -hmm. Now at that 5.30 to 8.30, I can be running more of my adult rec league stuff and still get some of the kids that are playing in the school programs linked up into the rec, rec as well. So how are we layering and structuring these things and cross promoting to our primary and secondary demographics to get this compound effect as that stuff is coming along? And uh, Rebecca, the last thing that we'll touch on before kicking it open to questions, and I appreciate you letting us go a, a tad long is, are you promoting? And Danny, I mean, this is a whole thing unto itself that everybody here can, can resonate with, but what are some of the key things that we wanna make sure that we're focusing on now as far as reaching these groups? Yeah, visuals. Visuals are huge, especially when it comes to, to video or virtual mm -hmm. tours and walkthroughs and things like that, because mm -hmm. all of our businesses in this industry is all built around a visual um, and sensory experience. Mm -hmm. And so you want to be able to provide as much visuals and pictures and um, videos and uh 3D virtual walkthroughs, all those pieces as much as you can mm -hmm. when you have your marketing efforts. Um, and we could dive into that or really, yeah. really, really deep. We don't have a lot of time for that, but it's important mm -hmm. to bring in some of these pieces. Yeah. Um, and also make sure that, like we had mentioned earlier, is that you're not just going to be blasting out the same message to all people at all yeah. times. You're going to be segmenting your messaging and your marketing, mm -hmm. depending on what platform you're using who specifically you're trying to target on that platform mm -hmm. and those types of pieces, yeah. which is important to remember. Yeah, it's it's not just the the general, you know, PA announcer system that's being broadcast to the entire baseball field. You are trying to very specifically target, hey moms, we have these great birthday specials that are going on where you can, you know, get this extra value add onto the power party package mm -hmm. if you want that. Hey kids, we have these killer new games that you can come and play on our virtual reality system. So you are again going to stop the mass broadcast pieces and really start even if it's the same piece of core information, mm -hmm. but you want to have it resonate with the two different groups, don't make that stuff the same for both groups. Do two different posts that are oriented towards both of them. It takes 30 more seconds, but the return that you get on that time and effort spent is dramatic. And so that's the, the big thing is take those little extra moments, look at how you can layer and, and create some nuance with this, both operationally, marketing wise, and just what you're bringing to the table as far as your experiences go. And, and focus it back mm -hmm. to what is my audience? How do I reach them? What is their motivators? And, and how can I tap into that and actually utilize it to its fullest extent? So that with that, we kind of got into some open questions. If there's time for it, Rebecca, let us know and, and we're, we'll uh, cede the stage to you. <laughs> 
Awesome. Guys, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for that great presentation and just for walking all of us through the state of uh, the FECs right now. I mean, gosh, it is very exciting that we have this whole year ahead of us. I hope everybody's feeling jazzed about this and moving forward and kind of just have their idea around some of these target demographics, where they're sitting, where they're living, what they're going to gear things towards, what they're going to change, start and stop doing. I mean, it's a new year, right? We're still in January. Um, let's see, we do have a question here and I have a question for you guys as well. Mm -hmm. So let's see, we operate 100% VR. We have a small free roam area, free roam arena with two EXPs. Do you see a future this year? And what are some great free roam experiences available on the market? Can you go offline with this? <laughs> okay, never mind. Not a not a question that we want to ask on here unless you want to address it a little bit. Yeah. So just just touching on that, Todd. I mean, you have through like Steam platforms where there's a lot of open source developed games um, where you can do a little bit of the DIY experiences. There are plenty of, of developers that are on there that can do a great job as far as programming goes. One thing though is that it's not a one size fits all. So like what your system specs and, and it's almost like if you bought a Ferrari, but you're trying to put unleaded gas into it, you're not going to get the same performance out of it, right? And so you need to look at, you know, some of these games, it was like, well, I designed this for this type of computer with these specs and this processing. So maybe if I'm running something different, that game may not run as well, but there's a ton. I, the, the nice thing is that it's very low risk. So you can download, you can bring those games into your um, into your mix and actually test and experience them to see how it's going to run on your system. Um, I love free roam. Free roam is going to be something, you know, we've been focusing on it uh, as well as others where there's, there's a lot of opportunity that's there. Um, the biggest thing right now, and, and we're just on the cusp of being able to get these next breakthroughs as far as being able to open up a variety of experiences within free roam. Because what you've seen to this point is there may be two or three things, but because free roam was either, was typically done at a larger scale at warehouse, you know, pieces, now that we're scaling that back down and getting in there, the innovation is, is coming along with it. And so as it's getting into its next phases on free room specifically, there's there's lots out there. Again, I like it. I've, I've done a variety of different free room experiences, so you should definitely be there. But you even more so, you're going to be a connoisseur of what experiences are going to resonate with your guests. Um, surveying them more, asking what things that they like, what specifically do you like about this game? What don't you like about that game? So as then you're vetting new things to bring into your collection, um, your guests then can trust new offerings that you're bringing to the table. Great. Thank you so much, Russ. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm just curious, what are ways that operators can really get a new start or kind of re-debut to their audience? Yeah, so I'm glad that you asked that. One of the things that uh, that brings up a really good point is that we're almost uh, all coming to a grand reopening. Mm -hmm. Even if you've been open for a while, getting a lot of those customers back in the door, it's going to be like grand reopening for them. And so one of the things that we decided to build in order to make things easier for you as operators is something called a marketing launch package, mm -hmm. which comes with professional photography of your attractions. It comes with a 3D virtual walkthrough of your attractions that you can either embed on your website or you can put it on Google Maps as part of your walkthrough. Um, professional press releases from yeah. uh, a press firm that uh, agency that's going to, to kind of build out a whole list for you and contact them and, and get a ridiculous number of impressions in your market. Target local news organizations uh -huh. that and, we get some free press and all of that. Yeah. And and it's it's like anything else. You may not have changed much, but we all have changed somewhat, whether mm -hmm. it's how we're approaching these things or doing this. And now that you've been armed to the teeth with this brand new analytical thinking cap that uh, you, know, you guys will be in a position to, to tailor this. It's like my mom says, I don't need a reason to throw a party. So if you want to throw a party to relaunch, like get after it, like do you. And that's, there's, I mean, like we're alive, we're having a good time. We're in an amazing industry where we get to create killer experiences. So like, let's have a friggin' party. And so if you're going to do that, like make it bold, make it big, throw that parade. And, um, and those are great ways, you know, we talk about this as well. Like that's the type of thing that we want to focus on is providing additional like white glove concierge elements. That's part Part of the convenience where now again I can come to one spot and I can get more things that will check the boxes of what I need to be doing. We want to live that on what we're doing on the manufacturing side so that way then it also allows you to trickle that through to your guests. Awesome and Betty is asking how do we get that pre-launch package? 
just reach out to us. We can get you mm -hmm. all the details. Um, uh, we'll, in the follow-up email, have a bunch of links, including to our website. And on there, you can fill out um, a request a quote or request a consult form, yeah. and we'll be happy to give you all the details on that. For sure. um, and then one last thing I did want to shamelessly plug real quick, if you would allow us, is that um, uh, somebody had mentioned this in here. We do have another educational event that we're hosting in just a few weeks, mm -hmm. Amusement 360. It's going to be a virtual event. Mm -hmm. February 23rd through the 25th. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be phenomenal. Man. We're so excited. We're going to have uh, probably 15 or more speakers, at least 20 hours of content. Dual tracks of content that focus on existing operators versus brand new startups. So that way, if it's, hey, I'm sending some of my existing GMs because they need to get beefed up because I'm getting ready to move them over to a new store. Great. They can focus on marketing and operations. But if I'm brand new and I, I'm like, I haven't seen a presentation on how to start layering SBA loans and, and all of these different things. So now we'll, we'll have more options and tracks for you guys to be able to explore. So you can completely customize the educational content that you have. We'll have killer keynote speakers that will mm -hmm. come in and just light you on fire. Um, I think you guys have had Jason Barnaby as part of your webinar series. And like, we love Jason. He, we brought him to our facility or our events two years ago now. Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, it's awesome. So it's, it's a great opportunity that will have a lot of value um, that we're super proud of. It has our awesome team at PCS that are our partners on um, with this and they'll be there uh, with bells on as well. And so if you guys want to check out and register for the event, I believe Laura posted the link as well. Um, and you can go to amusement360.com slash event. And uh, yeah, Laura did put it up there. So check out the chat list. And um, uh, to our PCS friends, thank you, Rebecca and, and everyone. Thank you guys so much for allowing us to, to come up here and, um, you know, dance to the organ music. We, we really appreciate getting to, to spread the gospel of kick-ass operations. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you have any feedback or have any topics you'd like us to discuss, please be sure to email marketing at partycentersoftware.com. This podcast is a weekly podcast, so you can expect new episodes every Thursday. Party Center Speaks is powered by Party Center Software. We are a facility management tool that helps family entertainment centers and event venues book more parties and manage their facilities. We also offer marketing services such as custom website design and marketing automations to help you expand your reach and grow traffic. If you'd like to know more about us, head over to PartyCenterSoftware.com and please be sure to give us a follow at Party Center Software on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and at Party Center Soft on Twitter. Until next time, thanks for listening.